Well, let's open our Bibles to First Chronicles 22. Now you know right where that is, right? First uh, Second Kings, First Second. I mean, First Second Samuel, First Second Kings, First Second Chronicles. First Chronicles 22. Another one of those that needs a little light on it now and then. But First Chronicles 22 is a setting from which we remember the fact that 3,000 years ago, the largest fortune ever amassed, you know, the current fortunes, be it the Vanderbilt or the Rockefeller or the Gates or the Buffett or the whoever, um, none of those fortunes really are that large as they compare to the whole totality of wealth available in the world. This fortune was more than half of all the wealth in the entire world, which in today's dollars would be about 125 trillion, would be half of the 250 trillion in wealth. But 3,000 years ago, the greatest human fortune ever amassed on earth was passed from a father to a son. And it's right here in First Chronicles 22. King David, and the year was 970 B.C., gave Solomon one million talents. Those were bricks. One million talents of silver. A million silver bricks. Hmm. That's a lot. That means somewhere between 60 and 100 million pounds of silver. If you're a coin collector, can you imagine sorting through that? You know, I mean, that was an amazing amount. Uh, that would be 30 to 50,000 tons of silver. And that was the smaller part of the inheritance. It was worth, if you look on the uh, commodity exchange, somewhere between 14.4 and 24 billion dollars at $15 an ounce. And the reason there's a variance there is that in this time period there were two talents, a 60-pounder and a 100-pounder, a 60-pound brick, 100-pound brick. We don't know which weight brick, but both were a lot. But David also gave Solomon, if, if you continue reading down there in the 14th verse, he also gave him not only 1 million talents of silver, but 100,000 bricks of gold. That was much more. A hundred thousand gold talents were between six and ten million pounds of gold. That's around three to five thousand tons. That's a lot of gold. And uh, that would be worth at the close Friday about a hundred and fifty billion dollars at nine hundred and fifty dollars an ounce. That's a lot. That was the largest personal fortune ever amassed up to this time. But just to give us a perspective, living in 2009, David had one million more pounds of gold than is in presently in Fort Knox. David had collected a million pounds more than America has collected so far. And by the way, that's the largest, Fort Knox is the largest gold holdings of the wealthiest country ever in history. That's us. It's the largest single amount of gold ever been amassed in modern history we have right now in America. And another piece that would help us understand what was going on in the 14th verse is that David at that moment, according to those who measure the commodity of gold, and there's a lot of discussion on that. In fact, all the gold in the world ever that's been minted would fit in three normal size ranch houses. If you took three ranches and just set them like boxes on top of each other, that cube would be all the gold there's ever been in the whole world. And David had half of it. That's amazing. Just to give you an idea, in today's dollars, David would have had $125 trillion. And that even means a lot, even in our day of trillion here, trillion there, government spending going on. That was a lot of wealth. But we're looking at, in the 14th verse, the first temple. The first temple was built from all this and a lot more that couldn't be measured, as you'll see as we read through the verses. But David, here's the key. We're looking at prophecy. We're going to, looking at the final sign of Christ's return. And we're looking at the third temple, as you could call it, that's going to be built sometime between now and Christ's return. But to understand the third temple, the second temple is one Jesus was in. You've got to understand the first, and that's this one. And that's the one that David built by giving all of his treasures to God. 
So the thought in our minds as we read these verses is, what did the richest man in the world do with a million talents of silver and a hundred thousand talents of gold? He gave it to the Lord so that his son could use it in building the first temple. That was the single most costly structure that still has ever been built on this planet. And it was built from David's treasures given to his Solomon. How do you think Solomon got to be the richest man in the world? He just started with the largest fortune and added to it. And it's amazing to think about. Well, from that incredibly vast inheritance, Solomon built a temple known as the first temple. And we can read about that amazing event in 1 Chronicles 22:14, And you just follow along because we're going to read a little bit later our passage together. But follow along in verse 14 of 1 Chronicles 22. This is David speaking. And he says, Indeed, I have taken much trouble to prepare for the house of the Lord, a.k.a. First Temple, 100,000 talents of gold and 1 million talents of silver. And then he says, and bronze and iron beyond measure, it's so abundant. So he had a lot more that they didn't even weigh. There was too much. I've also prepared timber and stone that you may add to them. And on and on he goes. Well, this, this isn't quite at the end of his life. In fact, for those of you that are students of David's life, right at the end of chapter 22 is when he wrote the 30th Psalm, if you like to know when Psalms happen. So right there he wrote the 30th Psalm. But keep tracking to the end of the book. And let's look at the 29th chapter of First Chronicles because that's where we're going to read together the first few verses. In First Chronicles 29... David is ending his giving process. This first part that he gave was actually, if you want to know where it came from, it is the collected treasures of all the nations that he conquered. Everybody in sight of the land of Israel he conquered and hauled back all the loot. He did that for 40 years. He never lost a war. As far as we know, he was never wounded. As far as we know, he was never injured in any way. Uh, in hand-to-hand combat, always winning every battle. And in every battle, he hauled the loot home. And he stored it up, not to be famous, but for the Lord. But on top of that, he had more. He had what's called his own special treasure. How would you like, if you had $150 billion of gold, but that was nothing, you had your special treasure. That's what we find in chapter 29 of First Chronicles. And I'd like to read with you down through verse 5. So if you're there, let's stand together for the reading of God's Word and follow along in your Bible, 1 Chronicles 29, and I'm going to read the first five verses. Furthermore, King David said to all the assembly, he called the gathering of, of Israel, and he said, My son Solomon, whom alone God has chosen, is young and inexperienced, and the work is great because the temple, that's the first temple, is not for man but for the Lord God. Now for the house of my God, I have prepared with all my might gold for things to be made of gold, silver for things of silver. We already read that in 22.14. Bronze for things of bronze, iron for things of iron, wood for things of wood, onyx stones, stones to be set, glistening stones of various colors, all kinds of precious stones and marble slabs in abundance. Verse 3. Moreover, because I have set my affection on the house of my God, I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house. Look at the end of verse 3. My own special treasure of gold and silver. Now this was much less, but there was something even more special about it. Um, I'm not sure if you know gold is gold is gold, but maybe it was better gold than normal gold. I don't know. But look what he says there in verse 4. 3,000 talents of gold... That's a a third of a million pounds. That's a lot. Of the gold of Ophir. And 7,000 talents of refined silver to overlay the walls of the houses. The gold for things of gold, the silver for things of silver, and all kinds of work to be done by the hands of the craftsmen. Who then is willing to consecrate himself this day to the Lord? What a powerful, wonderful section of Scripture to think about. David, and how he looked on winning in life, 
and how he looked on treasures in life and what a model he is for us, truly the man after God's own heart. Uh, In the words of the songwriter, all he had had come from God and all he had belonged to God and nothing he owned, nothing he possessed, it all came from God. And so he willingly, without any prying needed, just gave it back. What a wonderful example. Look back at verse 6. Because what's amazing is, and, and I'm not speaking about this tonight, but do you know what the response was to David's sacrificial giving? Verse 6, Then the leaders of the father's houses, the leaders of the tribes of Israel, the captain, and all these other people, verse 7, did the same thing. They went, wow. If he does it, I think we should too. And, and that's a tremendous part of the, of the work of God in the hearts of his people through following the example of leaders. Um, Many years ago, I remember we were adding on, uh, much like the children's wing here in Tulsa, and uh, the church, just like Calvary here uh, in Tulsa, didn't believe in borrowing. And so they said, uh, they told me we're going to build this uh, million-dollar building. You need to preach about giving. And I said, okay, how long? They said, six weeks. I said, then what? They said, then we take the offering. I said, sounds good to me. So I preached on giving for six weeks. And on the six weeks, on the sixth week, all the elders met in prayer, just like we do here, and they all had little pieces of paper, and they never told me about it. And all of them had for six weeks been praying, and each of them wrote on their slip of paper how much they were giving. And it was you know, anonymous. They didn't sign it, but they just wrote on it, and they handed it to the chairman, and the chairman added it up. And just the elders gave 180000 themselves. And I thought, whoa, it's good going in this offering. And so I preached, and they passed the plates, and they took up that day 600 more thousand dollars it was wonderful and then the rest came in the next few days after that so they got all eight hundred thousand they needed to start and what i thought was how just like with david that the leaders sacrificed and the people saw that and responded because they wanted to worship the lord and then you know what happens i don't want to leave this before showing you verse 10 on about david's praise to god and blessing the lord and instructing his son. It's a very fruitful uh, passage, 10, all the way down through 15. Um, In fact, all the way down through 19 is just incredible stuff. But in that context, think about what David did. David gave his lifetime savings, all these tons and uh, tons and billions, to the Lord, and his his son took it and made this lavish structure. And it stood there for 40 years during the life of Solomon. And then if you know anything about the biblical record, as soon as Solomon died and his son took over, Shishak, king of Egypt, came and looted the whole temple, took all the gold away. So I want you to think with me. Riches are very uncertain in life. Just 40 years later in 930 B.C., Pharaoh Shishak sacked Jerusalem, stripped away the gold from the first temple, took it all back to Egypt. In fact, the next time you look at the dazzling treasures of King Tut's tomb, though he was from an earlier era, it reminds us of the vast amount of gold that was surrounding the land of Israel. And think about the fact that Pharaoh hauled off all these thousands of tons of gold. And by the year 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar took what was left and destroyed the first temple, absolutely razed it to the ground. All of David's life's work gone from a human perspective but you know when we read this passage we just read god doesn't say we lost it we lost david's loot that he gave to us no once you give something to the lord it never never goes away think about that it is an incredible investment i just met someone this week and they told me that they have two relatives one of them was a hedge fund manager and the other is a investment banker or something, both of them had invested everything in this incredible double-digit return they were getting, and both of them lost everything, and all they have left is their house, which no one seems to want to buy these days. That's, that's true loss. Having your gifts given and have the Babylonians and the, the Egyptians steal it all is winning, because if you first give it to the Lord, you never lose it. Well, continuing, the first temple that David invested all this gold in, is gone. So about 520 B.C., a second temple was built. And if you remember Zerubbabel, 
Zerubbabel went back, and you remember the preaching of Haggai and Zechariah and Malachi, all were in this post-exilic time, and the exiles returned, and if you remember, they were weeping as they built the second temple because it, they could still remember the first temple and all the gold, and they built it only out of limestone and rock and there was nothing beautiful about it but it was still a worship place for the Lord and it says that the weeping of those that remembered the old was as loud as the praising of those that were excited they built a temple and so the second temple began in the 6th century BC just about 520 onward BC and by the time we get to the New Testament period in about 19 BC Herod the Great the one that the wise men came to and that killed all the babies and that that king Herod the Great, vastly expanded this second temple. He lavishly adorned it. The temple Zerubbabel had started, and it became a magnet for the wealth of the Jewish people around the world. So the gold started flowing back in. In fact, it was so lavish, Josephus said, that it would blind you in the setting sun and the rising sun, depending which side of it you were on. When the light reflected off the gold that was, that was covering the walls of the temple... They would just beat the gold and they would put sheathing on the walls of the temple. It was so reflective, like a mirror. It was blinding. There was so much gold. And they didn't just have it on the walls. They hung it. They made Herod wove a vine and branches out of solid gold. And it's just just incomprehensible wealth that was lavished on the temple by God's people in worship. So much so that by A.D. 70, the Romans uh, wanted it. So they completely destroyed the temple, fulfilling what Christ said in Matthew 24. Jesus said not one stone of the temple would be standing on top of the other. And uh, a couple weeks ago, I had all the saints, I, I had them stand and put their hands on those piles of stones that are right down on the ground uh, at the base of the temple mount. And I said, if you want to see a fulfillment of prophecy, put your hand in there and take your picture because there's one you can actually touch. Those are the stones that were standing up above on the Temple Mount that the Romans pried apart to get the gold out from between them. That's why not one stone was left standing. Because when they started the Temple on fire, the gold, which has a low melting point, started melting and it ran in the cracks between the stones. So they literally pried every stone of the Temple and threw it to to scrape the gold off to take it back to Rome. And so the second Temple went the way of the first Temple, And not one piece of it was left. But this evening, we're looking not at the first temple, David and Solomon, not at the second temple, Zerubbabel and Herod. We're looking at the third temple. Because there's actually a third temple cited in the Bible and described. The first temple was 3,000 years ago. It was built by Solomon. The second temple was 2,000 years ago. It was enlarged and adorned by Herod. Both are gone. Both are completely destroyed so that almost no trace of them remains. Now, they have found a few little traces, like they did find the little plaque that said, Gentiles, on the penalty of your own life, don't cross this point. That was in the courtyard of the temple. They did find the upper corner of the temple wall where the trumpet would be blown by the priest announcing the start of the Sabbath and the end of the Sabbath, that they found inscribed in stone from the very pinnacle of the temple. But they haven't found any of the pieces of the temple because they were all torn and thrown and carted off. But four people cited the third temple. And that's what I want to take you through to see tonight. Jesus saw another temple that was here on earth. It was in the city of Jerusalem. It was during the tribulation. Jesus could see it. So that's all I need is if he saw it. Daniel saw it, Paul saw it, and the Apostle John saw it, and each described a fully functioning third temple in Jerusalem during the tribulation period. Now the Bible also talks about a fourth temple. This one is huge. This one is big enough for the whole world to come through. That has eight chapters of description. You've probably read it in Ezekiel. If you don't fall asleep in Ezekiel and last till the 40th chapter of Ezekiel, from 40 to 48 talks about a millennial temple. And that one is when when Jerusalem is the capital of the whole world, when Jesus is ruling the whole world with a rod of iron, and all of the peoples of the earth have to come through the temple in Jerusalem. If they don't, you know what it says in, in the Scriptures? It won't rain on their garden their crops, their fields. In other words, there's drought for every, every person that won't come through the temple to worship God and to honor Him. And it's very interesting. So, of course, 
most of the people start coming and they get the idea. But that's the fourth temple tonight, the third. And the third temple that Jesus and Daniel and Paul saw and described and that John greatly describes is a sign of the end of days. And as we read in the newspapers, did you know just Saturday? Yeah, I have a little Google alert that every time someone talks about Jerusalem temple, I get a, you know, one of those news feeds on it. A speaker came to Haifa University from Egypt. Can you just think of that? Everyone criticizes Israel. Israel allows free speech. They allowed a rabid Muslim rabble rouser and a, basically a proponent of terrorism to speak at Haifa University, a Jewish university, because the students wanted him to come. And you know what he said? The transcript you can read on the news. He said, those Jews are trying to build another temple and destroy our Dome of the Rock. And I thought, thanks for saying that. I'm preaching on that on Sunday. And you, Mr. Muslim scholar, know what's happening, don't you? And he said, do everything you can to stop them because that's the sign that their Messiah is coming. Isn't that interesting? That's part of the motivation of the Muslims. In fact, they know and they think they know enough that they have put their graves in front of the eastern gate. Muslims are being buried in front of the eastern gate of Jerusalem because they have read the Bible uh, or think they've read it and they think that Jesus is a priest. You know, he's a great high priest, so they know the Jewish priests won't go near graves. So they're putting their graves there, hoping they'll stop Jesus from coming. And that's the way they think. 